to uh, a potential future. Um, because you have in this form of MAGA republicanism the idea that we, habeas corpus, we have the body. We control the body. When Donald Trump says, as we just noted, women will be happy, healthy, confident, and free, you will no longer be thinking about abortion. To me, that's dear leader speak. That is nationalism speak. How do you interpret, uh, uh, more importantly, how should we interpret and understand the connectiveness of what these stories are saying, you know, about a potential future in America? Yeah, I'm so glad that you're phrasing it this way because it sends a chill down my spine when uh, Donald Trump says women won't have to think about abortion anymore because he also said something similar about voting uh, when he talked to a group of evangelicals. He said, after this election, you won't have to vote anymore, as though voting is a kind of burden. And so this is fascist talk where the fascist leader says, I will free you from all decision making. Just trust in me and you will not have to worry about any problems anymore. And but what they're doing is, in fact, this also goes back to fascism. You know, the, the woman becomes her body becomes a tool of the state. The state has the right to decide what she does with her body, but also becomes a tool. And this is part of great replacement theory and demographic schemes that the woman becomes a tool to make the right kind of babies for the nation. So mm. this is this whole constellation of speaking in this way, uh, coupled with the actual tragedies on the individual level, goes back to the origins of authoritarianism. We know now, Alex, what happens when Donald Trump gets to make decisions about women and their bodies. And Vice President Harris knows. I want you to take a listen to something she said. This is from Madison, Wisconsin, a rally there about how Amber's death was, in fact, preventable. Medical experts determined that Amber's death was preventable, preventable. So understand what a law like this means, what these kinds of laws mean, these kinds of laws under Trump abortion bans. It means doctors may have to wait until the patient is at death's door before they take any action. Nobody wants that. She called it preventable. The other word she used was predictable. In fact, both are the case. And I thought it was very moving when you heard. I mean, I know, I know your reporter tried to tell this story multiple times, went to the families. The families weren't sure that they wanted to tell the story. And finally, it was the mom who decided, I need to share this story so it doesn't happen to someone else's daughter, so that someone else's grandchild is not left motherless in the aftermath of choices that Donald Trump has made. There's just something rich, to your point, about the fact that Donald Trump says, trust me to make choices for you. And then we as Americans are now watching and bearing witness to the aftermath of the choices that he has made. The word predictable really comes to mind here. Kavitha Sarana, a relentless reporter, has been writing for at least a couple of years, uh, for a couple of years about the fact that doctors have been saying these laws were not written with medicine and science in mind. And they predicted that this was going to happen. So these exceptions do not protect the life of the mother. And they do not surprise anyone. Ruth ben Giat, Alexandra. Hello again, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me this Saturday. I'm Frederica Whitfield. All right, we begin this hour with our breaking news. Vice President Kamala Harris has accepted an invitation from CNN to debate former President Trump on October 23rd. This would be their second meeting on a public debate stage and would take place in the final few weeks of the campaign. After initially rejecting a second debate with Harris following his September 10th showdown with her in Philadelphia, last week Trump suggested he might be open to another debate, saying, I'm quoting him, maybe if I got in the right mood, end quote. The CNN debate would mirror the June debate between uh, Biden and Trump with a similar format in which Trump and this time Harris would field moderators' questions for 90 minutes without a live studio audience, and it would take place at the network's studios in Atlanta. A lot of people say, oh, do it, it's great entertainment. I've already done two. The problem with another debate is that it's just too late. Voting has already started. She's done one debate, I've done two. 
It's too late to do another. I'd love to in many ways, but it's too late. The voting is cast. The voters are out there immediately. So let's turn now to our panel, CNN senior political commentator and former senior advisor to President George W. Bush, Scott Jennings, and CNN political commentator and former senior advisor for the Hillary Clinton 2016 campaign, Karen Finney. Good to see both of you on this Saturday night. Scott, let's start first with you. Let's talk about this potential debate. Do you think that the former president should reconsider this invitation, or do you think it's the right call for him to, to not do any additional debates? Well, first of all, I should say I do have great confidence that CNN would put on a good debate. So we'll start there. We did a great one in uh, in Atlanta. Uh, number two, I have been skeptical about whether he should do another debate. I had thought maybe not. You know, he's done seven. Uh, take the Biden one out from the summer and the other six. The snap polls have always judged him. This goes back to 2016, not to have won the debate, even though it didn't keep him from beating Hillary Clinton. He did lose three to her. So I, I've, I've just wondered, what are you going to get out of this? Uh, and uh, and is it is it worth your time when you're running a campaign? And he's right that late. You know, I'm not sure it would make a huge difference. You know, <clears throat> when you're using your time, you're asking yourself, am I am I getting something positive? And I I just don't know that there is anything to get. So I think he's probably making the right call here. And Karen, for her part, Vice President Harris seems very keen to have a, a, another debate. Her and her team um, very happy with how the last one went. What do you think? Look, I think the any opportunity to have such a direct contrast between the former president and our vice president is a win for the vice president. She did very well during the debate. In large measure, I mean, her own performance, but we also saw, you know, Donald Trump has really lost a step from where he was in 2016 or even some of the debate performances we saw in 2020. We saw a lot of rambling. We saw, you know, he really had no discipline, no ability to stay on message and to stay focused. So I understand why they don't want to do a debate. I agree with Scott. Of course, a CNN debate would be excellent and a great opportunity. But I, but I, I understand why he doesn't want to do it. And I do think it would be another great opportunity for the vice president. I think anytime she's in that environment, she's, you know, showing what a strong leader she is. What's your viewpoint? Here is it um, unnecessary, you know, or, or would it be instructive for the former president to debate again? Well, I think the, pre the former president would be crazy to debate again. I mean, he's not a particularly good debater. <laughs> uh, you know, he did terribly in the last debate. Uh, the only re it, it, he, he uh, benefited from Joe Biden's implosion in the first debate, but he's not a good debater, and he's so easily triggered and trolled by Kamala Harris, he, and he doesn't really discuss policy well. And he has a problem with facts and truth. So I, his, I'm sure his campaign doesn't want him to do another debate because I suspect they know it will go very badly. And it's as simple as that. I just can't imagine any reason why he should go up there. Uh, it's just a, it, he'll just have another drubbing. Oh, well, you heard the, the former president spinning it there saying, um, you know, she's the one who performs so badly and this is like a rematch and that's what a fighter would do. But he needs to grow support. So we know his supporters are with him. Would it not be an opportunity to get more support? Well, sure, I guess, well, I guess he could, uh, <laughs> it's an opportunity. But the question is, what will he do? Will he, will he continue to, you know, be triggered? Will he be distracted? Will he talk about uh, people in Ohio eating cats and dogs? Uh, will he not be able to answer questions whether or not he supports uh, Ukraine in the war against Russia? I mean, I just don't know that he's capable of giving answers that would actually help him grow his support. He's done nothing up to this point to really expand upon his base. He doubles down on his base all the time. He needs to grow it. So this opportunity, I think he would blow it if he if he took you up on it. Gotcha. And Julian, we know the former president, he likes to come across as looking strong, saying no to debate is does that make him look strong? Well, no. I mean, he will spin it the way he's spinning it to act as if he's defending himself. He's under attack, which is his traditional rhetoric, but does make him look for many voters, I'm sure, scared. I think many people will see it the way the congressman just described it. Uh, and this does undermine some of that image, although, again, for his supporters, his image endures. And we see those polls don't change much. So it's what do the small pockets of undecideds think? And I don't think this benefits, but I don't think there's much he can do. 
I think he knows enough to know the odds are this could go very poorly for him. And he knows, I think, despite the rhetoric, that that last debate was not a good TV performance, which is something he does measure. Brian Stelter, let's bring you in. Good to see you, Brian. Uh, welcome back on, on the weekends with me. So uh, what? Yeah. how do you assess this? I mean, Harris and her campaign have said yes. Guys, what we're seeing right now are Trump events and miserably for him and Harris crushing him because what Donald is doing is not only signaling to moderates, independents, uh, people who aren't voting for him but are interested in the state of the race that he's not he doesn't have the juice anymore and he's more and more insane right so he's obviously further alienating the people who would never vote for him but whatever like from his perspective you were never going to vote for him if you watch my videos so he's not losing you he's already lost you uh or if he ever had you at all right but it also alienates those moderates who may vote for him right shocking as it is but also when he said there and this gets into, you know, Harris crushing him. But when he basically said there that if I lose this time, I'm done. I'm not running again in 2028. One, we don't believe him, right? We know that if Trump loses, he's going to do another big lie and try to do another January 6th. And there's no way he doesn't try to run again in 2028. And given the cult, frankly, I think the party would nominate him again. Sh as stupid and shocking as that is. But this is a bad move for him because his, his cult does not like weakness or any sort of admission of defeat. Trump has conditioned them and trained them and uh, indoctrinated them into any weakness being unforgivable from him or anybody else. And so when Donald Trump says at this press event that he just had that he will not run again if he loses... What that tells me, guys, is the cult is going to turn on him. And that means MAGA is going to be booing him at his own events.